Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Crime Uncut. In today's video, we will be looking at the disappearance of Fiona Harvey. This video is part one of a two-part series. In this part one, I will cover the disappearance of Fiona as well as the police investigation leading up to January the 15th, 1990. In part two, I will look at the police investigation after Gert van Rooyen's death and critically assess if there is sufficiently reliable evidence to tie Gert van Rooyen to Fiona Harvey's disappearance. To the extent possible, I will give the information the police gathered in chronological order so that you know precisely what the police knew at any specific time during their investigation. However, before we continue, please become a partner in crime and hit that subscribe button. For all of those that have already subscribed, thank you, I appreciate it. If you turn on notifications, you'll know immediately when I upload part two. Let's get into it. Uh, Fiona Harvey disappeared without trace just three days before Christmas on the 22nd of December, 1988. It was a Thursday. At the time of her disappearance, she was only 11 years old. And she lived with her mom, Eve, dad, Richard, and sister, Carrie, at 17 Moreland Drive in Clarendon, a suburb in Peter Maritzburg. Apparently, Fiona was a very quiet child and loved horse riding, and she liked to draw. And she also attended horse riding lessons. Now, according to Fiona's mother, at about 13.05 on December the 22nd, Fiona left the house to go and buy milk at the tea room, also known as Del Superette, about 600 meters away, situated on Roberts Road, right next to the Clarendon Primary School, where Fiona has just completed Standard 4, or Grade 6 nowadays. Fiona's mom gave her four rand to buy two liters of milk, However, Fiona decided that they needed more, so she took some of her own money to buy an additional two liters. Her mother said it was not necessary, but Fiona insisted. Bare feet and dressed in a t-shirt and shorts, Fiona presumably walked this route to the tea room. It would have taken her about 10 minutes. In an affidavit, the owner of the tea room said that Fiona arrived at the store at about 12.15 or 12.30, and first asked for two liters of milk and then paid for them. Then she went back to the refrigerator and bought another liter. And then she put the remaining chains on the counter and asked whether there's enough to buy a fourth liter of milk. The owner counted the chains and said that there is enough. So Fiona got another liter of milk and the owner then placed the four containers of milk in two plastic bags, a blue one and a pink one. The owner said that Fiona was quiet and shy and did not speak to anyone else. According to Fiona's mother at about 1340, when Fiona was still not home, she realized that something must be wrong. And then she walked to the tea room where the owner told her that Fiona has already left about an hour before. She then searched frantically up and down the road asking people if they've seen Fiona, but nobody did. Word spread quickly that a child was missing and many people from the neighborhood joined in the search. One of them was the school principal, Digby Rhodes, father of the famous cricketer, John T. Rhodes. The police were called to the scene, but despite the wide search, there were no signs of her anywhere. At this point, we need to take a quick pause and talk about exactly when did Fiona leave the house to go and buy milk. Now, Fiona's mother said that Fiona left the home at about five past one. And she did so in several statements and interviews with the police. It would have taken Fiona about 10 minutes to walk, so she would have arrived at the tea room at about quarter past one. And if we assume it would have taken the about five minutes to buy the milk, she would have left the tea room at about 20 past one and arrived home at about 1.30. Now, when Fiona wasn't home at 1.40, about 10 minutes after the estimated arrival time, Fiona's mother got worried and then walked to the shop to ask about Fiona, where the shopkeeper told her that 
she served Fiona about an hour before. And according to the owner, Fiona arrived at the shop at about 12.15 or 12.30, meaning that she must have left home at about 12.05, between 12.05 and 12.20. Who is correct? And this is not a trivial matter. I have seen no evidence that the police resolved this obvious contradiction. Fiona's mother made a total of three statements between the alleged abduction and April the 5th, 1989. And in all of them, she mentions five past one. And it does not appear as if any attempt was made with Mrs. Harvey or the shop owner to resolve this time discrepancy. Later, you'll see there was a witness that saw Fiona Harvey along Roberts Road at approximately midday between 12 o'clock and 1.30. So his time frame also does not clarify this issue either. I have seen official police correspondence that use 12 o'clock as the time, and I've seen other documents that still use five past one. Now, by between 8 and 10 the next morning, members of the community watch, the municipality, the army, and additional police were summoned and were deployed in three groups to conduct a wide search for Fiona, as far as the Fort Tracker High School and the Botanical Gardens. And by 10 a.m., photos were obtained from, from Fiona's parents, and a flyer was made and distributed. Newspapers as well as radio stations were informed. Then on December the 28th, that would be six days later, the first person that saw Fiona that day came forward. A home renovator called Ernest Portgitter or Ernie Portgitter. He called the captain Dion Terblanche and informed him that he has seen the young girl reported as being missing in the media on the day of her disappearance. The following entry appears in the police docket of 30 December 1988. I have translated it into English. Ernie Potgitter saw a base LDV with a white canopy, with a colored, wearing a white golf cap, talking to Fiona. She shook her head and then the LDV turned around and drove towards her. And he, I presume Potgitter, then continued further. Mr. Campbell from 15 Moreland Street confirmed this and said it was an El Camino LDV. Note that no information was given about the location nor the time of day of this sighting. And I cannot understand why the police did not ask Mr. Portgitter this crucial information or if they did, why it, it was not recorded in the investigation diary. Much later on January the 5th, 1990, the police spoke to a witness that recalled seeing a white LDV making a U-turn at approximately the same spot where Portrita also saw the, L, the LDV. So this corroborates Portrita's observation that the driver turned around. Now note, at January the 5th, 1990, there were a lot more information available as to where Portrita actually saw this LDV. Although there is nothing about this in the investigation diary. Apparently there was a boy that told the police that he saw a white LDV, a Datsun Pulsar type of a canopy at the tea room. He supposedly saw a man talk to Fiona at the shop when she went in. When Fiona came out, the man called her to the vehicle and spoke to her again. And there was also a woman in the vehicle. The boy then went in to buy something and when he got out, he just saw the same LDV driving very fast out from the side road. And there was only a man in the vehicle then. Now that's all we know about the sighting. No time, no descriptions. And for reasons I am not aware of, it doesn't seem like the police took his sighting very seriously. Now, if you look at this map, I'm not sure which side road he's referring to, possibly this little dirt road that leads to the cemeteries at the back of the school. On January the 4th, 1988, the investigation diary contains the following entry. Unknown person gave information, vehicle NR9660, white LDV with canopy. 
often attempts to pick up children, several complaints, Indian men. This is just but one example of the leads the police received. Here's another example from the investigation diary dated March the 8th, 1989. Both, that being two white females, reported that a suspicious white male with a sallow, dark complexion has been seen by various school children near for near Fort Tracker Senior Primary School in various different motor vehicles. This person follows the children on foot and sometimes in the motor vehicle and has been seen in a maroon colored motor vehicle, a light blue Nissan LDV, and has also been in the company of a white female on occasion. Interestingly, on January 18th, the school principal, Digby Rhodes, told the police that only one kid in the school came forward since the schools opened and that this kid saw a red Monza vehicle stop at Fiona, but that the car drove off without Fiona getting into the car. Potgitter was again questioned by the police on March the 8th, 1989. And in the police docket, this interview is summarized as follows. During the investigation of this case, white male Ernie Potgitter was interviewed and maintains that he saw a child fitting the description of Fiona Harvey being approached by a white male who he describes as being 35 to 45 years of age with dark brown receding hair with two to three days old beard on his cheeks and who was wearing a white golf cap in Roberts Road opposite Clarendon School on the day that she went missing. He described the motor vehicle driven by this person as an LDV old model, either a Toyota, Isuzu or Master, which was beige in color and had a light white canopy. Now this maps show the general area in which Potgitter saw Fiona. Now note that the colored from Potgitter's first uh, statement to the police now became white male. And now he could see receding hair in spite of the person wearing a white golf cap. Please note that at this point, the investigation diary contains no information on the approximate time of the sighting or that Fiona was carrying a plastic bag. Therefore, the diary does not contain sufficient information to say whether the sighting occurred before or after Fiona bought milk or in which direction she was walking. I acknowledge there's a possibility that this information was verbally given to the police and for some reason it was not recorded in the investigation diary. Now also on March the 8th, the police interviewed a Mr. Campbell who said white male Campbell was also interviewed and noted a white Chevrolet El Camino LDV driven by a white male who he described as being approximately 35 years of age with longish dark hair and who had the trampy's appearance on the corner of Kitchener and Moreland Road at about the time Fiona Harvey went missing. Now this yellow area shows the intersection of Kitchener and Moreland where the El Camino was observed. Then about a month later on April the 16th, 1989, the police interviewed Digby Rhodes, the school principal. White male Digby Rhodes, principal of Clarendon School, was questioned and informs investigating officer that he was making use of his son's Isuzu LDV, which is beige in color and has a white canopy on the, tw on the 22nd of December 1988, and that he was busy with paperwork at the school in Robert Road and had left the school approximately one a half hour prior to the alleged disappearance. This person also frequently wears a white cap and closely fits the description supplied by white male portraiter. See entry dated March 8th, 1989. So Mr. Rhodes left half an hour before the alleged disappearance. On whose timeline? Fiona's mother or the shop owner? Did he leave at about one o'clock or did he leave at about 12 or 12.15? Now, over the course of 1989, the police received many tips and leads from the public, including an inordinate amount of calls from psychics claiming to know where Fiona was or where her body could be found. However, a number of legitimate suspects were identified and were investigated, 
and seems they were eliminated as suspects. One such person was the infamous Willem van der Merwe, also known as Kruffy, the screwdriver rapist. Now between September and November 1971, he raped at least nine women. He would dress in white overalls and visit women's homes, claiming to be an electrician, whereupon he would then rape them. Eventually he was apprehended and on March 22nd, 1972, he was sentenced to death. This sentence uh, was subsequently commuted to 20 years in prison by the appeals court. Then in March 1987, he was granted parole and released from prison. He then started working as a carpet layer. About two weeks after the disappearance of Fiona Harvey, on January the 4th, 1989, Scruffy abducted and then raped two women in Cape Town. While he took one of the women into the bush to stab her to death, the other woman managed to get hold of his gun and then shot him in the head when he returned while holding a bloodied knife in his hands. He died a few hours later. Now, during the course of the investigation, the police found evidence that Scruffy checked into the Wolferfall Resort at Bad Plas on the 18th and then left again on the 26th. On this basis, they initially eliminated him as a suspect. However, further investigations revealed that on about midday of the 20th, Scruffy left the resort and only returned sometime on the 22nd. The exact time of his return is unclear. He told his friends that were with him at the resort that he went to Durban and that he did not stay longer due to the beaches being dirty and full of non-whites. He told them he did spend one night in Durban and that it took him nine hours to drive to Durban and that he had to pass through three toll gates. After his return to resort on the 22nd, he then stayed with his friends until they all left on the 26th. Now, it would have taken Scruffy about six to seven hours to drive from Peter Marisburg to Bad Plas. He was away for two nights, and if he slept in Durban for only one night, the question is, where did he sleep the other night? Almost two weeks after his death, on January 16th, the forensic laboratory conducted the mat macroscopic and a microscopic analysis of hair found in Scruffy's vehicle and compared it with a sample of Fiona's hair. The results were negative, a match could not be made. But keep in mind a very famous saying, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because a hair could not be found is not evidence that she was never there. At this time, photos of Scruffy obviously appeared in the media. And Ernie Potgitter later said in an affidavit made in January 1990 that he was absolutely convinced that Scruffy was not the same person that he saw in the Bayes LDV talking to Fiona. On April the 16th, the child abuse unit brought to the police's attention of a man who worked at the business right adjacent to the tea room that sexually abused and raped his own daughter at frequent intervals from the age of eight years old until she was 19, sometimes violently. At the time, he was still employed at this business. Photos of the abused daughter were obtained and there was a marked resemblance to Fiona Harvey. Unfortunately, the investigation diary doesn't contain any further information about in the investigation into this person. In August, Ernie Potgitter again contacted the police. He claimed that on August the 4th at about 5 p.m., he saw the same LDV and the same driver that he saw on the day of Fiona's disappearance at the corner of College and Alexandria Road in Peter Maritzburg. He tried to make a U-turn in order to write down the license plate details, but unfortunately he couldn't do that because the traffic was too heavy. On June the 7th, 12-year-old Joan Horn was abducted in Pretoria by a blonde woman driving a Ford Bantam LDV white in color with blue stripes on the side. And on September the 11th, Odette Boucher and Anne-Marie Wappenaar were abducted in Kempton Park. A young and older man and a green and white combi were seen in the area sometime before their, dis their disappearance. 
on November the 3rd, Yolanda Vessels was abducted also in Kempton Park. She went to the same school as Odette and Anne-Marie. Yolanda was last seen in the presence of a blonde woman driving a green and white combi. On November 21st, the investigating officer interviewed several of the officers or investigating officers uh, investigating the other abduction cases. And it was concluded that no link could be established between the disappearance of all these young girls. Then the next big break came on December the 12th, when the police conducted telephonic interviews with uh, Mrs. Wallace from Menlo Park in Pretoria and her mother, Mrs. Smith from Ireland. Now, on the, they say that on the day of Fiona's disappearance, they were house sitting at 55 Kitchener Road. They said that they noticed a white, off-white Japanese model LDV with a canopy, with a ladder on the roof, and with red writing on the doors in a semicircular shape, driven by a white male in the area for two to three days in succession. The last sighting of the LDV was apparently on the day that Fiona disappeared. According to Mrs. Smith, these sightings occurred between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. and admitted that it is just a rough estimate and that it could have been earlier. And then on the basis of the information received from these phone interviews, the investigating officer drew the following sketch. Now, I imagine that the police officer uh, obtained a little bit more information in order to determine that the canopy was not actually a canopy as you and I know it, but of uh, more of a vehicle rack, a metal frame. Uh, please note that there is no information on the direction the vehicle was traveling in or whether it was stationary or moving. On December the 18th, the investigating officer contacted the press liaison officer regarding a press release. And on December the 20th, a description of the vehicle as given by Wallace and Smith appeared in the newspaper. Now on December the 20th, probably in response to the newspaper article, the police received information from someone that lived at 17 Waffle Drive, who observed a suspicious LDV parked against the fence at the corner of Moreland and Kitchener Road. The date of the sighting is unknown. This person also said that she saw Fiona on the 21st, the day before her disappearance, at about 1.20 p.m. walking along Waffle Drive. On the same day, the police obtained information from another resident, and this one lived at 15 Waffle Drive. And he noticed an LDV on the 21st at about 10 p.m. parked on the birds at the corner of Moreland and Kitchener Road with a white male sitting in it. So now we have four different sightings of a stationary or moving LDV at the intersection of Moreland and Kitchener. There is Campbell that said he saw a 35 year old trampish looking male in a white El Camino LDV at the time of Fiona's disappearance. We have Wallace and Smith that said that they saw a white Japanese style LDV with a canopy or a frame moving past the house days before and on the day of Fiona's disappearance. There is the resident of 15 Waffle that saw an LDV parked at the intersection of Moreland and Kitchener at about 10 p.m. the day before Fiona's disappearance. And then there's the resident from 17 Waffle drive that saw an LDV parked at the intersection with the date and the time unknown. Also on the same day, the 20th of December, the police received information of a 43 year old man that rented the house in Hilton, just outside Peter Marisburg, that lived there until about March or April, 1989. He supposes they had a torture chamber built into his house and had a history of raping females in Howick and Peter Marisburg areas. It was recorded that he drove a Toyota Base LDV with a white canopy. Apparently, he regularly went to Johannesburg on business for two to three days. At the time, 
and could fit in with all the disappearances in that area, as well as in Peter Maritzburg. And he also fitted the description provided by Ernie Potgitter. A week later, on the 27th, the police traced this man to East London and found that he actually owned a Toyota, Tirola, a Toyota Corolla car, and they therefore no longer considered him a suspect. Uh, however, there's no information as to whether someone checked whether at some stage before he might have owned an LDV and perhaps sold it. On January the 5th, 1990, the investigating officer was informed that the meeting will be held, I presume of all the different investigating officer of the other disappearance cases, to establish if a definite link exists between the various crimes. However, this meeting became unnecessary because of the abduction of John Boysons and events that followed. On January the 11th, 16-year-old John Boysons missed the bus on Church Square in Pretoria to take her to school that morning. According to John's statement, while she was waiting for the next bus, a woman approached her and offered her a lift to the school. She accepted and then got into a white and green combi with this woman. Along the way, the woman told her that she had to make a quick stop at the house to speak with her brother, and then drove to the house with a large advertising board on the outside, which said Van Royen and Broers. She said the woman invited her in and offered her a glass of Tropica to drink. And while the woman showed her through the house on the pretext of showing off her plants, in the main bedroom, a man came and tried to kiss her. When she resisted, he slapped her, and after falling onto the bed, he put her in a stranglehold and pointed a gun at her. She was then supposedly handcuffed, forced to take pills, gagged with pantyhose, her underwear was removed. He touched her privates, and then he locked her up in a hallway cupboard. The man then left while the woman went out to work in the garden. Joan said that she, however, managed to escape from the cupboard and the house and ran out into the street towards a cafe while the woman chased her. Then a passerby in a white police vehicle stopped and picked her up and then later took her to the police. That same evening at 7.45, quarter to eight, she pointed out the house where she was held uh, and this house was at 227 Malherbe Street and belonged to a Gert van Rooyen. And with him in the house lived his fiancée, Joey Harov. And on the 14th, she identified the combi that belonged to Gert van Rooyen as the one which picked her up on the 11th. Now, up to this point, the names of Gert van Rooyen and Joey Harov has never surfaced as potential suspects in the disappearance of Fiona Harvey. And for those viewers that have never heard of Gert van Rooyen, here is a brief background. Now, at the time, Gert ran a construction business with his brothers. And he also did work for a company called Dell Clamp Industries that installed fire doors. In and around August 1988, van Rooyen did work installing fire doors at the SCBC in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Gert van Rooyen had a criminal record and has spent time in prison before. In 1979, he was sentenced to four years in prison for abducting and then sexually molesting two girls, 10 and 13 years old. After his arrest in 1979, Pat Van Rooyen was evaluated by a psychiatrist at the Vescopis Hospital in Pretoria. And he was diagnosed with a personality disorder to such a degree that according to the Mental Health Act of 1975, would classify him as a psychopath. Among others, this diagnosis was based on the following observations. Manipulative behavior, pathological dishonesty, insincere emotions, lack of normal fear, and self-centeredness. Several people, even some of his own family, reported that their were two sides to Gert van Rooyen. There is the Gert van Rooyen, the Christian, an upstanding member and elder of the church. And then there was Gert van Rooyen that supposedly had a temper, was abusive, smoked pot, abused alcohol, 
own pornography, engaged in sexually explicit conversations with others, and had frequent sex with many different women. Van Ruyen divorced his first wife in 1983, and then got involved with Joey Harov in 1988, and then got engaged to her at the end of 1988. Now, the day after Boysen's abduction on January the 12th, after receiving information about the abduction of Joan Boysen's, the investigating officer of the Fiona Harvey case proceeded to Pretoria. Now, remember, at this time, the only link between the Boysen's and the Harvey case cases was that Gert van Rooyen loosely matched the description that Ernest Potgitter provided. White male, 35 to 45 years of age, with dark brown receding hair, two to three days old beard on his cheeks, and was wearing a white golf cap. Although the police claimed so, the vehicles could not provide the link. As the Ford Bantam LDV that van Rooyen owned at the time, of Boysen's abduction was not the same old style LDV that Potgitter saw. It should also be noted that at this time, Gert van Rooyen was 53 years old and the police has not yet spoken to any witnesses that have seen Gert van Rooyen wearing such a white golf cap. So after the police established the identity of Boysen's abductors, they were quick to start interviewing Gert van Rooyen and Joey Harov's family. And January 13th, the police took a statement from Maria, the mother of Sinet. Sinet was Gert van Rooyen's daughter-in-law, and she was married to Gerard, Gert van Rooyen's son. And they lived with Aletta, which was Gerard's mother and Gert van Rooyen's ex-wife. Maria said that on the previous day, the 12th, her daughter called her. She started to cry and told her that Gert van Rooyen came to them and told them that he was involved in the abduction of the missing children. Please note, she did not give the names of the children. She said that Joey would drive the Volkswagen Combi while van Rooyen would sit in the back and inject the children to subdue them. She also said that Joey recently abducted a young girl in Pretoria and that the girl escaped. On January the 14th, the police took a statement from Poppy, half-sister of Joey Harov. She said that on January the 11th at about 11 a.m., that must be shortly after Joan Boyson's escape, Joey called her and Joey was very upset and told her sister that she had kidnapped a child and that she was going to be arrested. She was afraid and that she was trying to get hold of Gert van Rooyen. Joey said that van Rooyen was sex crazy and threatened her to do it, to abduct this girl. When asked if she had anything to do with the disappearance of her niece, Yolanda Vessels, she promised that she had nothing to do with it. She said that she then invited Joey over so they could go to the police together and Joey said that she couldn't do that because she would be hanged. After the phone call, Poppy then called Peter, Joey's son, to come over, and together they compared an identikit of the woman involved in the abduction of the Joan, in the, in the abduction of Joan Horn, with a photo of Joey and noticed a remarkable similarity, apparently right down to the earrings. Peter then called his mother's place of work and found that Joey wasn't at work on the day of Jolanda Vessel's disappearance. So here is the identikit and photos of Joey Harov. And as you can see, there are no earrings. On January 14th, the police took a statement from Sanet, and she said that Captain Ruin arrived at the house, presumably on the 11th, and told her mother-in-law that Joey had abducted a girl, handcuffed her, put nylon stockings in her mouth, locked her in a cupboard, but that she somehow escaped and got picked up by someone in a white LDV. This closely matched Joan Boyson's version of events. It should be noted that Sunette did not tell the police what she told her mother, as well as her neighbors, that Gert van Rooyen admitted being involved in the abduction of other children. 
on January the 18th, the police took statements from neighbors of Sinet that lived two houses down from her. They said that on the morning of the 12th, Sinet arrived at the house while they were still in bed and told them that Joey abducted a child and that Gertrude Ruin admitted being involved in the abduction of the other missing children, that they were still alive and that he regularly took food and cool drinks to them. Now, I'm not giving you this information about what the family said because I necessarily believe it to be 100% factual, nor do I want you to accept it as such. The veracity of these statements is perhaps something that I need to look into for another video. But I simply want to show what the information the police were exposed to and what they have to rely upon to inform their conclusions about Gert van Rooyen's involvement in the Fiona Harvey case. So it seems that on January the 13th, Gert van Rooyen and Joey Harov drove down to Durban. And according to Joey's half-sister, Poppy, Joey called her twice a day. The first call was at 1 p.m. to say that they were in Durban, and again later that evening at 7 p.m to say they were in Scottburg. They actually spent their last weekend in Umtloti. Apparently at about 4.30 on January 13th, a traffic police officer pulled Gert van Rooyen over for speeding on the N3 going southbound through Peter Marisburg. He was doing 93 kilometers an hour in the 60 kilometer per hour zone. Later on February the 6th, the traffic officer made a statement that he saw two girls on the back of the vehicle under a pink blanket, sitting very still as if they were dazed or cold. He later recognized them to be Anne-Marie Wappenaar and Odette Boucher. Now there's a juicy discrepancy here. According to Poppy, Joey called at 1 p.m. from Durban, while according to the traffic officer, he called Gert for speeding at 4.30 p.m. This is perhaps for another video. Then on the 14th, Gert van Rooyen and Zoe Haro for some reason decided to return to Pretoria without the two girls. And unbeknownst to them, two officers were already staking at the house. When they arrived home in Malerba Street at around midnight, they noticed a police car that started following them and a chase ensued that ended up in the death of Gert van Rooyen and Zoe Haro. They died of bullet wounds to the head. And the official version is that they committed suicide. That's all for part one, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you found this video interesting and informative. If you did, don't forget to subscribe and to press the like button. Soon I will bring out part two. Until then, take care. Thank you.